Welcome to Transforming Indian Family Court System. A few months back, we had published a video of findings of our survey of legal professionals and parents who've been through the Indian Family Court System. And the findings revealed a rather dysfunctional system whose acts of omission and commission lead to four out of five children crawling out of the family courts semi-often. That is, they lose not just one parent, but also one half of their family, including grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins. In order to discuss reforms that would make our family court system child and litigant friendly, we have with us today a true legal icon, a gold medalist from during an LLB from Jodhpur, twice elected as secretary of Supreme Court Bar Association, a passionate fight for children's rights and against the tobacco lobby led her to become India's youngest designated woman senior advocate in the Supreme Court of India. And now she holds the coveted position of additional solicitor general of India, one of the youngest in India to do so. I'm particularly proud of her achievements for she hails from a defense background. Her father retired as a group captain from Air Force and her father-in-law was a brigadier in the Indian Army. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Eshwarya Bhatti. Thank you so much for your kind words, sir. Now, thank you so much. And we also have with us uh, Mr. Jatin Kachira, which our viewers definitely know of. Mm -hmm. um, he is obviously the founder of Child Rights Foundation, and um, you've seen him us in interviews for a number of times. So welcome, Ms. Bhatti. Uh, you know, as you're aware, we are talking largely about the Indian family court system and specifically its impact on children and child rights. Therefore, let me ask you directly and straight away, right? Do you think the Indian family court system has failed our children and or failed to protect the rights of our children and is in need of drastic reforms? Well, I wouldn't agree with one half of your statement that it has failed our children, but I would certainly agree with the second half of your uh, statement that it is in need of drastic reforms. You know, the Indian Family Court Act uh, was introduced um, in the 1980s, 84. This act is of 1984. And uh, India is a country in, uh, you know, we are, as a society, we are going through a, a, a movement or a journey of catharsis. So what has helped so far and what are the drawbacks? You know, <clears throat> what is happening today in the family courts is uh, obviously, I mean, th th this is a place where you try to bury your matrimonial disputes. It, it, it's, a, it's a family in distress that comes to the family court. Uh, there's a very interesting saying in the family law that uh, so long as there is love between the parties, they're not governed by any law. As soon as the love uh, goes out of the door, law comes in from the window. So the family is in distress. The whole mechanism was provided so that, you know, they are taken out of the traditional court mechanism. And, an, and a child friendly, a family friendly atmosphere is made available for them to resolve their disputes. But there is a long way to go. I mean, the, the, the family courts have today uh, really, they've, they've not been able to achieve the goal <clears throat> for which they were set up. We are seeing that more and more children are being used as a as a pivot as a tool to settle the matrimonial disputes rather than really uh, you know welfare of the child being paramount so there are definitely huge issues and uh, i mean that needs to be that needs to be addressed urgently right now uh taking it forward you know there is a very famous um, quote by mr nelson mandela who says that there is no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way it treats its children. And if I were to take that forward, let me uh, quote certain undisputable facts. Let's, let's, let's put it out there, right? If I were to look at it, Honorable Supreme Court of India is supposed to have a family court committee, which hasn't met in the last four to five years for the time being where we've been uh, you know, availing and following it. 
there is one PIL which has been formal, formed or uh, filed, at least one, asking for shared parenting, asking for practice guidelines <clears throat> to be formulated, right? It's been pending and the government itself has not responded to that PIL for more than four years now. They haven't even filed a reply. If I were to look at during the COVID times, there were at least two PILs formulated and both the PILs asking for just daily virtual communication in the Supreme Court. Both the PILs were completely disposed of without even consulting a child psychologist. I think the problem is not with disposing of, but more about without even consulting that what is in the best interests and welfare of the child. Going forward, if I were to look at it, NCPCR, Ministry of WCD, both conducted a huge roundtable conference, multi-stakeholder, which has clearly minuted that there is a strong need for having guidelines, that we must have a protocol against what we call as parental alienation, what you rightly said about uh, parents using this as a tool to uh, or as a weapon to settle their scores. But lastly, what you actually said, the parliament here gave all the rights to the judiciary 35 years back to frame rules, to set up guidelines, to enforce whatever ways through the Family Courts Act. Yet, there has been zilch action on it. So if I were to look at it, with all these points put across, how would you rate as the soul, or what does it say about the soul of our judiciary and the government? Because government has, neither has the government taken any action on this. So, uh, Dr. Kapoor, I don't share your uh, extreme pessimism on this topic. Um, and I'll tell you the reasons why. A, I must uh, start with a caveat that I am not uh, privy or uh, in, well informed about uh, whether the committees have met or and one, when they have met, etc. So there's no point in me commenting on that because I don't have, I'm not privy to that information. I've not looked that up. Um, I also have no idea about the PILs that you're speaking about. But I can certainly tell you from somebody who has been practicing in the Supreme Court for almost now 24, 25 years. Also, a third caveat is, I am a union law officer, but I am here only in my personal capacity. So the views and the thoughts are, that I'm expressing and sharing with you are just my own. Uh, in no way uh, is this any way connected to the government. Now, having put those three caveats out of the way, I think uh, <clears throat> as a regular practitioner of the Supreme Court, I can tell you that public interest litigations are assigned to benches. They are heard for admission hearing first. And only if the bench thinks that the cause requires it to be taken further, then the notices are issued. It is not just about, uh, you know, that you haven't got a hearing. The hearing is always there. And let me tell you that, you know, the pendency of matters, <clears throat> it's not just PILs and family court matters. That is a that is a plague, if I can use that word, that is really, in, you know, infesting our system, our entire judicial delivery system. Uh, is uh, is in a big, uh, but if we start talking about the judicial delays, I, I, I don't think, uh, I mean, we are, that's a completely different, uh, not different, but it's a huge topic in itself. And uh, we, we, we won't be able to do justice to that topic in our conversation today. But I can certainly tell you that uh, Indian constitutional, uh, you know, courts, especially Supreme Court, they are amongst the more, most hard pressed and the most hardworking judges in the world. The amount of matters that they deal with, the, you know, we are a huge country. We are a, a huge country and a developing country at that. Our resources are stretched, our infrastructure, you know, I mean, there's a queue if you want a railway ticket, there's a queue if you want a, a, a medical facility, there's a queue if you want to get into a school, there's a queue if you have to come to court. But that's not because, the you know, the courts have failed. But it's because of the sheer number that we are and the fact that we, we are still, I mean, we are fast paced economy, but still a developing in economy. So we are struggling with our infrastructure on all ends and judicial infrastructure is also one such area. So it is not like the matters are not being heard. Judges are not sitting. In fact, let me tell you, Supreme Court judges 
dispose of more matters in a week than the uh, you know the, uh, the the supreme court of united states uh, even you know takes up for the whole year so that is the magnitude that i'm telling you uh, and you know of course the, I, I, without really uh, pointing on the prayers that you might have on the pil i think one more important thing that we must understand uh, dr kapoor is see family court system is not just for children it is really to deal with battered families now india has a very unique uh, situation i mean we are not a country where uh, you know traditionally uh, the husband and wife will come with you know fair facts before the court when you look at the matrimonial ads every boy earns very well handsome salaries but when they when it comes to maintenance every boy becomes a pauper he doesn't want to pay a penny that is the practical experience that we have in the courts now you know another experience that we have is the, the reason why the child is used as a pivot is because the you know they they feel that they need to get an advantage the battered spouse needs to get an advantage by holding on to whatever he has and whoever has custody or possession of the child holds on to the child as as long as as, as much as they can till finally orders are passed in fact if you see the final orders that are passed in matters like these the final orders are uh, are, are are you know they they sort out things very much it's the interim orders that become problematic and those interim and you know i mean child is growing up every day every month every year so time is of the most essence here but the problem is our, our system does not have the bandwidth to really deal with it on the with the alacrity that uh, uh, um, a matter like this deserves so i think uh, it will be naive for us to look at it uh, you know just from one perspective and prism without really i mean it, it, if the whole ocean is having problems and you say you know you know my my ocean hut has a problem or my fishing area has a problem uh, i feel that would be an ostrich syndrome we have to really understand the whole the perspective right now uh, before i just come to you jatin just to uh, you know so i think you raised some great points so i'm just wondering if i would say that you know see as i look at it that in any society the first people who need to be protected are the most vulnerable which is obviously the child so if we can't first put the focus on the child i think at somewhere and that is why i quoted uh, mr nelson mandela to actually say that we first need to put the focus on the child and then worry about everybody else that's uh, obviously firstly secondly what i was wondering as so one of the simplest solutions which we found all across the world is to have very clear cut guidelines which was what the family court system had said so just to give you an example in uh, you know one of the jurisdictions just bringing in guidelines and having these kind of practice rules and a parenting plan right brought down the a number of cases by 11% in just one year secondly the amount of time spent per case came down by about 20 year uh, 20% or so right therefore i was wondering do you believe or do you think we can actually work with first getting the supreme court to put its attention towards framing guidelines all across for the family court system which is what the family court act actually asks it to do so again dr kapoor i want to put one more a uh, couple of more facts in perspective that you know when we talk about issues with regard to children uh, it is not just the you know the custody or uh, you know uh, how they uh, how they you know uh, are dealt with in broken marriages uh, issues relating to children uh, are uh, engaging the attention and the focus of the country and this this is just one aspect of it you know the entire juvenile justice act the entire pocso act dealing with children who are victims children dealing with children who are delinquents dealing with children during the covid times the the pm care scheme for children going right up to their age of 23 <clears throat> pis that supreme court currently is hearing that i am aware of because i am representing the union government in that which is children in street situations children who have uh, you know lost their uh, 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 surviving or either spouse either parent uh, to covid or during covid they they've not confined it only to covid they're saying you know during the pandemic for any reason so um, 
the having said that because you know it's coming very gloomy that you know nothing is being done by our country i think it's important to bring that uh, uh, and then uh, to address the issues that we have i think we certainly need to move forward uh, i think the suggestion that you're giving in the form of guidelines is a very welcome suggestion because that uh, almost helps to put things uh, you know in a systematic manner <clears throat> if the guidelines are in place then it will be easier for the courts down the hierarchy to deal with the issues uh, you know in that manner but uh, also let me tell you dr kapoor i mean uh, uh, in my experience which is primarily of the constitutional courts practicing primarily in supreme court and high court when it comes to custody matters the judges uh, actually show a sensitivity that goes far beyond their uh, you know the, the requirement of their office they most often uh, most often the judges call the child they want to meet the child in chamber they speak to the child but you know courts is just one aspect of our life uh, sorry about my dogs but uh, courts is just one aspect of our life i think the problem really is in the society you know we uh, we have somewhere become uh, so revengeful in broken marriages that uh, today uh, you don't have very few matrimonial cases are uh, just on cruelty or you know just on uh, th there will be a, a dowry demand put in there will be a element of th theft there will be an element of breach of trust there will be an element of unnatural sex 377 is most often used in the matrimonial fir so the acrimony the bitterness is too much uh, but things are changing i have a few clients uh, you know i mean i used to have who uh, who would tell me that uh, they would like uh, to have co parenting and uh, they uh, so they they had that maturity to understand that it is in the best interest of my child that he has access to both parents and access not just as a visitor but access as in spending a good amount of time and getting to know the parent who does, who he doesn't stay with on a regular basis in you know on on long occasions so this um, thought process though very far between yet but is there in the society and i think uh, we need to see the advantages that it comes <clears throat> as a society i think you know dealing with courts is one aspect but uh, you know i am aware that your ngo does some very good work reaching out to uh, the society the families network etc and the conciliation cells the trained mediators in our courts are also doing a good job uh, uh, you know in in dealing with these aspects but it, it it's going to take a lot like it takes a village to raise a child dr kapoor it takes a will it'll take the whole country to really sort out these issues it's it's going to take each one of us no absolutely but just to uh, add to that i agree with you that the society needs to change and show its maturity but uh, it's only when there are immaturity which is where the uh, where i say which is where the under the parents patria jurisdiction that the family courts have that they must uh, be the guiding light they must show the way and uh, you know the reason why i am pessimistic is because i feel from what my survey has been able to which we've uh, done over uh, this thing shows that somehow unfortunately that guiding light is not being shown but jatin please go ahead you had a question yes ma'am reducing the judiciary's burden if we make prenuptial plans uh, agreements uh, valid it will save a lot of judiciary time ma'am what do you think about that allowing prenuptials it is an idea that we still need to see how it develops in india uh, jatin ji there are too many we are a very uh, we are such a diverse country you know uh, i don't know of any other country in the world where matrimonial laws are governed by personal laws ma'am our courts I, yeah i am a citizen but uh, uh, if uh, a matrimonial client comes to my office the first question i have to ask them is uh, ask her is how i mean under which law did you get married uh, the the concepts like you know dowry etc that we have the issues like economic independence i think economic independence is a very important fear that you know women in in broken marriages feel because india is still a country where men are supposed to earn the bread and butter and the uh, earning is you know his 
domain and the woman takes the job of the of the you know taking care of the house which is a completely unpaid <clears throat> unapologetic unnoticed uh, unnamed kind of a work but when it comes to matrimony i mean you look at any uh, any other developed country what happens is whatever is the matrimonial assets it gets divided right in between so the, i think unless if we if we don't really understand these aspects and expect that things are going to change just for the child because child is the only thing that she gets to hold on to and then she holds on to the child so hard that whenever the father has access to or the other side of the family i mean it could be interchangeable whenever the side of the family has access to you know people go we are doing so many matters where children have been taken out of jurisdiction of india and it's extremely uh, difficult for the children to be brought back so there are a lot of problems that that are there unfortunately there are no easy solutions okay mm. so uh, if i were to ask you before i get uh, this thing uh, in your opinion what are the two or three changes or reforms that you believe can be implemented because at the end of the day it's our children which are suffering children of this country of who are our children who are suffering and we are actually you know so i would go as far as to state that like mr david cameron uh, who was the prime minister of uk stated that one of the reasons why after a certain riots took place that one of the reasons why the riots took place is because somewhere we did not uh, rectify our family court system and those children who've grown up with uh, without the proper guidance from both the parents has led to these riots so before we reach that situation what are the two or three reforms that you feel that could be take taking place uh, so dr kapoor i want to uh... tell you one thing emphatically don't get me uh, i mean don't get me wrong that you know when i said things about how i'm not sharing your gloom or complete pessimism at the same time i strongly believe that india has a unique uh, strength which is our family system and that unique strength has to be protected has to be preserved and has to be you know uh, it it has to be made sure that it survives i mean children if we are not going to attend to children properly from battered and distressed families it's the future of our country that is at stake and we we can't do with just you know one or two quick fixes there are none there are incremental and transformative changes that are required in the legal system i think focus has to be on the real welfare of the child i mean that's an off used and off quoted word that the supreme court has laid down but what is really the welfare of the child the child needs that some amount of stability not to be seeing that bickerness i mean what what happens today is by the time the matters come up to the higher courts the constitutional courts they have been in, in the custody and control of one parent for so long that you know i had young children who would tell the court ki uh, you know meri maa to dayan hai the child who was living with the father because he speaks father's language or a child who was living with the mother said that i don't want to stay with my father because they have just seen that perspective so important thing has to be that this is not a uh, i mean when we deal with custody matters these are not matters that can wait till final orders i i understand that our courts are uh, heavily burdened but interim orders from the first date itself have to be collaborative i think it will also pay to uh, you know uh, pay in the form of you know add to if we could have the element of maintenance also included there itself because there is a, a, a i feel i mean I, as as a lawyer who's practiced uh, and seen these matters as a mother uh, you know as somebody who lives in the in the society and sees this day in and day out i feel that that in economic insecurity makes parties do things which are uh, you know which which could otherwise be avoided so some amount of maintenance orders to start with and also the child equal participation by both parents uh, no matter where the custody is it has to be it has to go beyond that visitation and you know one thing i noticed uh, i mean in one of your uh, one of your uh, lectures it's not just two parents it is our family system is unique i mean our, our, we have two 
huge sets of families to really really oceans to you know dab into and reach out for i mean uh, mental health is a issue in our country but uh, we still don't have personal shrinks because if we don't want to talk to our mother i'll uh, i'll speak to my masi i'll speak to my bua i'll speak to my mama's son or my chacha's daughter i mean we have such a beautiful um, you know a uh, prism of relationships which we can't afford to break for our next generation we are going to be a country with huge mental health issues if we don't attend to this here and now true so those are some thoughts on the legal aspect but certainly the change has to begin from our homes that that's when the change is going to be really a lasting change um i i i beg to slightly differ although i agree with most of the things that you say but if i may slightly differ is stating that at the end of the day we cannot reverse this revolution which has started off breaking up of marriages we cannot criminalize divorce per se right we cannot stop people from divorcing right the question is that we as a society need to learn from the mistakes that other societies have done much before us because they went through this revolution decades before us and learn what should be the best for the child and second i would like to you know just quote a very famous this thing which you mentioned that children do not need your presence they need your presence right we are at the end of the day a more spiritual less materialistic society the first thing that we must ensure is that our children get equal access to however i completely subscribe to your viewpoint which is to say that even maintenance should be included because that's an overwhelming part of uh, child's welfare but moving on you know like you mentioned uh you know you mentioned which parents use the child as a tool right now unfortunately that's where i believe we haven't yet moved into a sphere to understand what others have understood which is the really the thing about parental alienation and that being child abuse more than anything else therefore let me just quote to you the real elephant in the room as i would to say of how international jurisdictions look at parental alienation let me quote a judgment for you and read out it may give you a certain this is a supreme court judgment called james j miller so which they say across the country the great weight of authority holds that conduct by one parent that tends to alienate the child's affection from the other parent is so inimical to the child's welfare as to be the grounds for a denial of custody or a change of custody from the parent guilty of such a conduct a child's best interests are plainly furthered by nurturing the child's relationship with both parents and a sustained course of conduct by one parent designed to interfere in the child's relationship with the other parent casts serious doubt upon the fitness of the offending parent to be the custodial parent i would now like you to just pay slight attention to this line because this hits into what we are saying it is the duty of each parent to foster and encourage the child's love and respect for the other parent and failure from that duty is as harmful to the child as is the failure to provide food clothing or shelter perhaps it is more harmful because no matter how well fed or how well clothed a child cannot be happy if he or she feels unloved by one parent this is what countries across the world have moved on to is what i'm just saying and i just wanted to bring it to your attention but we somehow are not appreciating the entire welfare of the child in its true perspective because no such judgment has ever come in from india and this is not a stray judgment i can quote you judgments from uk spain brazil romania mexico european court of human rights all of them stating exactly this so what are your views about that 
there can be no quarrel with this proposition dr kapoor i mean this is the right way forward this is the perfect way forward if there is any perfection so to speak or i mean excellent way forward is certainly that we can see but uh, like we discussed that i mean we can't jump from the first step to the last step we will have to go through the journey mm -hmm. uh, there are i mean we we already discussed those uh, issues and pitfalls i think it will be um, it will be naive like we discussed to to really you know uh, disregard that it's not possible i mean it's not a, a question of disregard but i think it's not possible for it to be moved right to that you know before we have uh, dealt with at least the ironed out the at least the basic crises which exist because those are the reasons you know there's a <clears throat> there's there's a principle of interpretation of law which is you know which is the mischief so when a law is brought in there is a mischief principle which says that what is the mischief that the law is being brought in to you know to curtail that mischief now if you look at the family court act there is no problem with that act the problem really is with the functioning of the act it's not the act that needs a change or an amendment or anything it is really the system that is you know and the interpretation and the and the manner in which it is being worked out that needs to be changed that needs to be overhauled completely <clears throat> so now let us look at what not what more law is required let us look at what are the pitfalls that are not allowing this law to be operational to the to the to the best of its uh, optimal capacity i think jatin ji wants to say something please jatin ji you you're muted jatin you're muted sorry what is happening is when there is a non compliance of visitation orders and the con contempt proceeding is filed family court usually says that they have no power to deal in contempt if you go for execution proceedings after the orders of access are passed the family court many times they say in execution pro proceedings there is no provision of you know uh, execution i mean executing access we can do uh, you know attach a property or something like that but there's no remedy to give uh, access in execution proceedings but i would like to say madam we have already signed international covenant of civil and political rights there are right to effect to remedy and under that right courts have you know powers to you know grant access or execute their own orders which is not happening at a larger scale so contempt power is a very useful power uh, jatin ji for uh, for getting you know gets getting compliance of the judgments but uh, that is not just with family courts in fact contempt power is only with courts which are courts of record which is the constitutional courts so only high court or supreme court and even if the family court or any other lower mm -hmm. or subordinate judiciary finds that there is a contempt of there they have to refer it to the so that's the whole mechanism of law also uh, you know just bringing in contempt without really uh, addressing the follies that are happening is not uh, to my mind is not going to serve the purpose because it may end up vitiating more the atmosphere of the family courts we we don't we, we did not envisage family courts to be Uh, you know a, a, a strict uh, you know a, a penal kind of courts uh, which were which had that because their atmosphere completely changes madam by contempt i'm not saying that you put the other parent to a jail at least you can put uh, put some kind of monetary fines on them you can uh, you know punish them from sunrise to sun court something that can be done power, about but that power is there jatin ji and that must be exercised <laughs> in fact yeah. if if you if you uh, if you i mean notice that's what i was saying that we have to put focus on the process because yes. it has to be it has to start from the first interim order that is passed and follow yes. up on that it's not the final order that counts because by, by, you know by the time the, the these cases come up in the judicial hierarchy child is already adult yes yes no matter whether he you know he's not subject to the custody jurisdiction at all because it is then his will but his right. mind has been so vitiated by that time that uh, there is little that can be done so, so we family, can't wait for final orders in these matters so family court needs to act madam suo moto which is not happening in a larger scale actually ma'am so let me let me just take that point itself to again suggest another reform which i think may be very useful is so countries across the world uh, you know countries like brazil mexico romania spain uh to a degree even canada what they've done is that they've set up what we call as a protocol for management so let's say if you have 
if you've done contempt is just one of the things. Parental alienation is also about bad mouthing and other things. If you do one, these are the three, four remedies which they say that you must do. If you do second time, this is what must be done. Therefore, what we are suggesting is that a comprehensive protocol or guidelines, you know, at the end of the day, as you rightly said, the problem and our strength is our diversity. We, it's both a problem and a strength. Now, to manage that, why can't the Supreme Court of India, in consultation with child psychologists, set up a whole protocol for managing such cases? I I am somebody who's already subscribed to that idea of yours. I, I told you that that would be a very useful step. Okay. But adding to that, that protocol will require certain child psychologists and people with that kind of a training. Because, you know, see, I don't blame the judges. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the judges, they are not trained to look after child psychology. That is not their core strength. But the government has provided that mechanism through the Family Courts Act Section 12. Why aren't we seeing more child psychologists attached to the family court system? And they can be done. And they don't have to be formal psychologists. Even social workers with just six months of training in psychology is good enough because that's what they are using across the world. Yes, so you rightly pointed out Section 12 already prescribes and allows for that. <clears throat> Why it is not being used more? Again, we are going into the realm of implementation. And uh, let me tell you that it's not just this. I mean, whenever the courts deal with issues which are not within the special uh, domain or, the, you know, they need any special kind of uh, knowledge or skill, they seek the report from experts. So I think the best way to go about this now, I'm I'm giving you legal advice, which I should not be giving, which I'm actually barred from giving as a union law officer, is that you need to uh, you, you need to bring in your research in a proper manner before uh, a court of law. And uh, in fact, my suggestion would be uh, go to a high court first that they, they have they have more time and more you know energy at their hand. So I think that would be a better option. But I'm not going getting into any more discussion on this. <laughs> yeah, I, no, no. I'm just saying other thing. Uh, actually, many times in high court also what is happening, uh, judges who are looking after property matters or income tax matters, they are handed over the charges of uh, family courts, which they are not very well versed on. So do you think it is high time that we have a separate family division in the high court itself? No, I don't subscribe to your view. Then you will need a lawyer. You, need, you will need then judges for every walk of life. Judges are... Uh, legally trained they to be to judge issues and if they need assistance they get reports it's not like uh, you know you need to be an expert of that area but i mean what are we uh, all judges all lawyers ultimately they are only specialists in the area of law in fact not the specialists they are just students of law we, we are just law graduates and maybe some of us are post graduates etc but Training of law is uh, is the important training. I don't think you need expert benches at the level of constitution uh, constitutional courts. Fair point. So uh, let me come to something which is probably the second last question from my side or uh, from our side together would be, you know, you're aware, ma'am, that we've all gone through a huge amount of issue with the COVID pandemic over the last two years, which has taken a huge toll. And the biggest toll has been on children. The biggest toll, in fact. And there is going to be now a deluge of cases coming into the family courts and the entire judicial system as soon as the functioning of courts come in, uh, start and normal functioning happen. And child custody disputes are going to grow into an absolute, what we call as an epidemic, which is happening, right? What can the judicial system do to be able to handle this more efficiently? Like you mentioned, so that we don't, make a spiritual how what changes can we bring in how do we handle this deluge which is going to come in i don't think i'm the right person to give you an advice on that but um, they will have to be i mean it matters need time also you you can't fast track this process you you need to hear both sides you need to uh, understand you know the facts of the matter and then pass an order so i don't think this can be fast tracked in any way but i'm sure the you know, what is happening is uh, that uh, whenever during there are, and it's not like uh, physical courts have not happened. There have been stages, bursts of virtual courts. And 
when the wave goes away or you know subsides a little then we have had physical courts so it's been going on and off and when uh, we've seen at least in our courts we have seen that the uh, you know judges step up uh, to do that extra work and uh, you know carry on with that but um, after all i mean it's it's only possible to do what is humanly possible like right now our judges are sitting in their home chambers they don't have the assistance there is there are no files being made available to them or so they have whatever they have are soft files and um, it, it, you need a lot of assistance to be able to handle 50 60 matters in a in a day you need somebody to put arrange everything and hand it over to you etc so there are uh, these uh, th there are these limitations and problems that are there but i'm i'm sure uh, interim orders will have to be the will have to be given properly uh ma'am so in that regard itself if i may make a small suggestion you know something like what uk has done is i agree that the judges it's the problem the bigger problem today is that the judges do not have enough tools they do not have the support system so what uk did was set up a special body called the cafcas or the child advisory family court advisory and support services right and which had simple psychological social workers who could assist the courts with a large amount of information and tools so that the uh, judges can take quicker informed decisions rather than depending do you think something like that because you know see at the end of the day we'll all have to be innovative problems have come in because of the covid pandemic we can see a problem in front of us can we be proactive and innovative to do things i don't think so quickly another layer can be added uh, dr kapoor it it's not possible you you can't outsource the job of the factual assessment to another body you can take assistance but there are otherwise also assistance which is provided and available under the act and which is part of the mechanism of family courts for now in terms of experts in terms of ngos in terms of mediation and conciliation centers i don't think um, i actually i have not uh, seen that model also i am not well versed with it but i don't think in a pandemic response we can add a layer so quickly this will have to be well thought of it could become counterproductive all right fair enough so anything else that you feel that we could do to handle this issue because see both all of us sit here and agree that there is a problem how can we handle it better is the question well i don't think i can add anything to what uh, we have already discussed uh, but i think just to maybe sum up on the points that uh, we were ad item on and you know either you agreed to my suggestions or i agreed to yours i think a protocol or a guideline uh, coming from uh, you know maybe the supreme court or maybe the government which is mandated across it will have to come from supreme court it, uh, otherwise it's a it's a amendment in law otherwise it will have to be brought in that manner that is something that uh, should be brought in and i think the whole uh, narrative and conversation has to include the aspect of uh, so welfare of the child means having access to both parents as parents while custody may remain with one but the other parent also cannot be just a visitor in the in the life of Uh, the child it has to be both parents as parents um so um, uh, the other aspects that we spoke about was i mean uh, i i felt it was my uh, experience that i felt that maintenance issues if you know interim orders are passed on maintenance and custody and visitation etc together they do uh, they they are, they are likely to soothe the defrayed feathers a lot more and are likely to be lasting solutions and at the end of it uh, the real change really happens uh, with awareness that uh, your ngo is already doing and with all of us changing uh, at our homes because we have to realize that no matter how much we may hate or dislike or want a revenge from the spouse because these are you know actually these are relationships of love when they fall out uh, the acrimony is very bitter but uh, we we have to understand that it while it may be bitter and acrimonious for us if we allow that bitterness and acrimony to go into the child's life and his psyche then we have lost it all not just for ourselves 
but for our next generation also. No, wonderful. Those are extremely wonderful uh, words uh, said by you. And I hope all parents, whether living together or separated or divorced, should uh, should really heed to that advice. But it's when that people do not heed to such advice is when the courts start coming in, as you rightly said. So I hope uh, you know you could take some of the suggestions that we have made. Uh, you know because we are creating a society which can be very, very, very problematic or, uh, you know, in a way I call them spiritually bankrupt society in a, just a decade from today if we don't take the right efforts today. So if between the judiciary and the government, you know, because another body which is there which could help is NCPCR, right? So if something can be taken there and worked out, I think that will be wonderful. Jatin, anything else that you would like to say? No, that's it. We have covered, covered all the aspects, actually. Right. So any last words from you, Mrs. Bhatti? Well, I can wish you all the very best and God's <laughs> peace and great strength to you. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, not just courage, but a lot of energy, wherewithal to, <clears throat> to change the direction of the thinking of the society. Uh, frankly, you have taken up a cause which hitherto was, uh, you know, it was not present to the thinking or the thought process um, of uh, the justice delivery mechanism of the society. And um, I, I wish you all the best. I hope you succeed for the sake of our nation. Thank you Thank so you much for your time. Thank, Thank you, so you very much. much. We really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.